We're back with Restoring Creation, our explosive new series, which first, we have to do some housekeeping for scholars who, well, don't seem to know how to put things away, how to clean the floor, how to maintain and preserve, most importantly, the word, the most important part of their job, and they failed on this. That's okay, because in this age of increasing knowledge predicted by Daniel, They'll become impertinent, unfortunately, and many of us are starting to realize that. We wish we couldn't say that and wouldn't accept it's true, and we have already proven this many times. But this video will continue to unravel the ridiculous scoffing uh, of Zondervan and other scholarship, really scholarship generally, because they represent many, uh, so we can clear this up completely. And everyone will understand, Moses wrote Genesis, which these first three videos will prove together. Not any one, but the three, though all three will be powerful, uh, standing on, the, on their own. Uh, if you missed part one especially, which is, this is a continuation of, it's really best to go back and watch that first. Let's begin. Taking seriously the indications within the Pentateuch itself, again, a fraudulent term, never in Scripture whatsoever, uh, along with the post-Pentateuchal uh, references, that's a very nice scholarly word, but also stupid, uh, to the book Law of Moses. One might conclude that the Pentateuch finds its origins in Moses. Well, of course it does, because he wrote it, all of it, duh. And the fact that they don't know that, oh my goodness. Wait till we show, you show you the charts where it says Moses wrote, 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 Moses wrote. Hello, Moses wrote Torah, period. This is a lie. Now this point is valid in a sense, but the problem is they do not know the answer to the question. They raise so they go looking to, what, a cult text as to the origin of Moses. I mean, agreed, Moses did not live at the time of creation of Noah, nor Abraham. And this, we'll, we'll nail this down in the next video. Uh, so how did he get these accounts? Well, not from oral tradition. That is not the tradition of Israel. Sorry, it's not. It is not the Bible tradition. It is not an oral tradition. That's what the Pharisees do and did even to the first century. They still were not writing things down by doctrine in their own words, which we've caught them. We expose that in the original canon series. Watch it. So that part's illiterate. Basically, uh, you know, then they'll use occult writings and allegations uh, that occultists are making, which are equally stupid. Moses received the heavenly tablets, the written record, since creation on Mount Sinai. Duh. Now, don't worry. We're going to show you. That is documented historically and biblically. They ramble around in ignorance when that text is right under their noses, yet they ignore it and say, uh, duh, I don't know, right? That's scholarship for you. And actually, that's what this article says. I don't know anything. Then they make up some hippopotamus or something like that, right? I mean, it might as well be because it's a very foreign sounding word, though it's, it's actually simple to understand. Claiming they are, well, editorial editions or redacted like a CIA document. How stupid. There are no redacted portions of the Bible if there are. See, this is where they get this secret doctrine that doesn't exist. Yes, some knowledge has been lost. Books have been censored by Pharisees in fraud and the Catholic Church in fraud. Neither had such authority. Only the temple priests kept Bible canon. Therefore, their Bible canon is the Bible canon. It has no editorials and it has no redactions. Period. No one had such positions. That's illiterate. It's not the Bible paradigm, but that is how the Pharisees operate. See, they are liars, and they enjoy things like that. 
editorializing. If you read the Talmud, you'll just watch just one ramble after another. Well, this rabbi says this, and this rabbi says this, which are the opposite. And this rabbi says this, which is something totally different. And blah, 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 blah. And then eventually they conclude that no one really knows, right? I mean, that's what we're seeing in scholarship, and it's very Pharisee. They say, these additions, wait, you're not supposed to add to Torah, are you? Hmm, that's a problem, right? So they're assuming that someone's adding to Torah is a problem because it means they don't know the Bible paradigm. That brings a curse, folks. So these additions may only be the most obvious examples of textual material added after the time of Moses, so added after Moses, to Genesis and to uh, Torah. Hmm, really? Okay, so who was that fraud? Who is it? Who is it that changed the Bible? Please tell me, scholar, who is it? Well, it's you. Because you're changing it right here in this nonsense, which is not even true. That's the problem. So added after the time of Moses, and we cannot determine precisely what was authored by Moses or added by later inspired editors. Well, wait, 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 wait. If a later editor changes Torah, which is scripture that Moses commanded, you cannot change, you cannot add to, you cannot take away, and then they say that's inspired? That's stupid. They are cursed. They are not inspired. Those changes need to be abolished and abandoned if that was true. But see, it's not true. How do they not know scripture and then say such things as if scripture never, never warns not to add or take away from Torah? How can they not know that? What evidence do they present of this that Noah, or I mean uh, Moses, didn't author Genesis? Well, it's a lousy guess. That's all. They just guess. It's not a hypothesis because well, that requires education. These guys are uneducated because we just showed you they don't know the Bible. So their education regarding the topic here, which is the Bible, which is Genesis and Torah, is practically nil, it seems, because they can't read. It's pretty bad. But then, Zondervan concludes, so, who wrote Genesis? We'll likely never know with absolute certainty. Why? Because they want to leave you confused. They want to leave you without answers. They don't want you to have answers, and they're too irresponsible and negligent to research it out and try to see what the truth is. They don't know, and they're saying to you they don't know in that statement. They don't know. So this isn't going to answer anybody's questions. In other words, they admit they are incapable of proving anything, and they didn't prove anything by their own admission. So don't try to use a scholarly article or position like this and claim that it has anything to do with scripture. It doesn't, and they admit it. They just wanted to cast doubt. In scoffing, they call textual criticism, uh, which is not scholarship and never should be uh, in that arena. It's certainly not academic. It's, it's uneducated. But based on the evidence available, uh, none of which you know there, Zondervan, so who cares, uh, it's fair to attribute its origin to Moses, which you just undermined in your entire article. So they agree Moses wrote Genesis, but they don't know why, they don't know how, and they can't prove any of it. And they instead undermine it. Well, that's real smart. That's what they call scholarship, and it's, it's utterly uh, illiterate. These guys, they're, they're not reading, they're not understanding, they're far from it. A child could really do better, really. Uh, I mean, come on. Here's the problem that we want to address, and we could go through one article after another, one book after another, one YouTube video after another that relies on this illiterate thinking. The problem is, when they open this can of worms, which they're doing on purpose, they undermine the sanctity and the validity of Scripture and those who kept it, which is what they've called into question this whole time. And the enemies of the Bible then use this stupidity by so-called Bible scholars that are supposed to be defending the Bible and setting up positions that can't be assailed successfully, yet they don't do that. They tear it 
down. They operate against Scripture. It's not the Bible's fault, because it doesn't do that. The Bible never says any of this, and does not support it in the slightest, for we know Moses wrote Genesis indisputably. Let's go to the post-Mosaica, uh, after Moses, that they call uh, examples of adding to Torah later after Moses died. What do they say, and how exactly can they prove this, or can they? Hmm. No, they can't. What about post mosaica passages? This is their writing. But to say that the composition, even the origins of the Pentateuch, is to be associated with Moses certainly does not mean he wrote every word. Well, why not? I mean, why not? Produce who did write it then. Come on, come on, be a scholar, do your research, and show us who wrote it if Moses didn't. You have no one. You forgot about the encounter on Mount Sinai that only Moses had. And there is no one else qualified to write Torah. Period. The end. You have no points in this entire article. And again, read it all. We're not covering every piece of it. Traditional approaches to this question acknowledge that Moses did not write the entirety of the Pentateuch. Uh, okay, when they point to a so-called post-Mosaica. Okay, again, those passages written after Moses is what they're saying. The problem is, and they give examples, so let's rip through these examples. Are they even examples of things that occur after Moses? The answer, no. These are lies. The problem is, they don't know Scripture, they don't know the timeline of Scripture, so they get it wrong. It's pretty bad. So it's a false paradigm. Uh, so let's see what they are talking about specifically here. What passage, uh, you know, had to be written after Moses? What is it? Okay, so they say post mosaica are passages that had to be written after the death of Moses. And of course, the most obvious post mosaica is the account of his death. Okay, now we address that opening up uh, because we hear that from many and it has always been illiterate. Uh, now that's in Deuteronomy 34, the end of Deuteronomy, where Moses died. But Moses already told you he was prophesying of the period even after his death. He well knew he was dying as well in the passage. They just can't read. They can't go back a couple of chapters earlier and find out what Moses' mindset was. They forget that Moses was a prophet. Thus he prophesied and saw things in the future. Duh! Is it obvious that Moses wrote other prophetic writings, including after his death? Well, we already covered some. We began that with this video. So no, it, it's obvious this scholar just doesn't have any facts doesn't know Torah at all, and says nothing. And the scholars he's quoting are illiterate. That's what's obvious. We have already obliterated this one, but we wanted to bring it up. Uh, Moses wrote of his death, too, as he said he knew he was dying, and even wrote other prophecies beyond that regarding the Israelites. We opened with that. Uh, so we've got that. They cannot disprove that. Joshua would not need to add to Deuteronomy. Uh, he wrote his own book. <laughs> I mean, hello. So he didn't need to add to the words of Moses. And no one else would touch Torah either. And if they did, they are cursed and a fool to whom we should not listen. Now let's take on a couple more examples. Uh, and these are, you know, on the surface, you, you read it and you say, oh, well, maybe that's true. No, it's not. These are lies, and we'll prove it. They're extremely poor. Let's go. Zondervan writes, while Ur is an ancient city predating Moses, that's true. And the fact that they know that and don't realize that the Chaldees is the land of Ur is really illiterate. But we'll go there. The reference to Ur of the Chaldees, Chaldeans, which is the Chaldees, it's an area, uh, you know, they're just like you live in a city, it's in a particular area, uh, whether it be a province in the Philippines here, uh, we call them, whether it be in a state uh, in the U.S. or wherever. I mean, come on, this is not a concept that's really hard to understand. 
See Genesis 11.31, which of course is when Abraham and the title kings and that whole story, is a post-Mosaica, so it's after Moses, since the Chaldeans were an Aramaic-speaking tribe. That's false. Chaldeans spoke Hebrew. Oh, what? Yes, Chaldeans originally spoke Hebrew, and they lived in the days of Joktan and Peleg. Oh, Really? These guys don't know this? No, they don't. They're illiterate, even of Josephus, and we'll show you both. So they're an Aramaic-speaking tribe. That's a lie. That's false. Uh, that lived in the first millennium B.C. Yes, there were Chaldeans that moved to the area of the Chaldees at that time, including the city within the Chaldees named Ur, and they called themselves Chaldeans, but they were not of the bloodline of the original Chaldeans, which were Hebrews and spoke Hebrew. Duh. The fact they don't understand that, they don't know that, is really, really bad. I mean, this is pathetic. Long after the death of Moses, they say. Well, they don't know what they're talking about. First, they're claiming Moses did not write Genesis because of this stupidity. Uh, they don't know Chaldeans are far more ancient than Moses. The problem is, Moses records in Jubilees that Chaldeans, as a people were originally the sons of Eber, which would become known as Hebrews later, not yet, but later, especially in the time of Abraham. But Abraham migrated from the Chaldees to uh, what we call Israel, uh, but what was the land of Canaan at the time. Uh, and he was called the Hebrew because he was from Eber, Hebrew. There you go. Now, by the time frame they discuss, the term is hijacked, essentially, referring to an area where Chaldeans once lived, but Abraham left there. See, he migrated away from Ur, but it, the area is still the Chaldees since the sons of Eber, Peleg specifically, uh, migrated there from Iran. Uh, Joktan and his sons, Ophir, Sheba, Havila, they migrated to the Far East. But the point is, it was called the Chaldees. Do we know that for sure? Oh, we know that for certain, documented historically and biblically, uh, to 2200 BC, roughly, uh, well before Moses. So this point is a non point, it's untrue, and these should know better, but they don't. Let's go there. The real question is have the folks at Zondervan ever actually read the Bible? Because this is also in Job, written before Moses. I mean, how foolish. I'm sorry, you are to question the authorship of Moses what, based on this illiterate trash? Are you kidding? Grow up, scholars, and learn how to test your own words because they make you look so foolish. See, when we go to one source, the book of Jubilees, chapter 9, we're going to cover that more in the next video and explain a little more about Jubilees. Don't worry, we're going to get there. But even as an historical document, this is dated to at least 150 BC. So there's no way to argue that this is not history. We find the Chaldeans in an area called the, well, Chaldees, which is why they have such name. Hello. Uh, it's recorded as early as 2500 BC in Noah's division of the earth, which he did before he died. Hello. That's verses 4 and 5 of chapter 9. Now why? Well, because the sons of Eber were originally called Chaldeans. Are we making that up? No, Jubilee says so, and more than once we'll show you. But also, so does Josephus, we'll show you. And, oh, by the way, so does Job. But anyway, this is at least 800 years before Moses does. Undervan can't count. They don't understand dates. They don't know the Bible, and they have no point whatsoever on this. They simply don't know, and that's the problem with scholarship. Of course, they're repeating someone else's scholarship, which is inept anyway, but uh, they don't know it well enough to defend it, and even that person didn't bother to do the research, is negligent and irresponsible. They are not actually qualified to draw such conclusions. They're just not. They haven't done the research, they haven't done the work, and they're not showing us their work, are they, because they haven't done it. Now, how could they not at least reference Jubilees for geography, of all things. It has the first mapping of the world. Uh, I, hello. I mean, it's called willing ignorance. That's why. Uh, their conclusion is false because of that, because they choose to operate in such. In fact, in chapter 11, verse 3, 
Jubilees documents the actual history of the city of Ur of the Chaldees. Ur of the what? Chaldees. Boom. There you go. Moses wrote this, and we'll show you in the next video. Because Ur was of the Chaldeans as being founded by, well, a guy named Ur. Duh. This isn't hard. He's the son of Kesed, who named it after himself, basically. This guy, Ur, had a daughter, whom Rhea, the son of Peleg, or oh, what's he? He's a Hebrew from Peleg, from where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will come, right? And so here's Ru married to this guy's daughter because he lived in the Chaldees. Duh. Ur of the Chaldees, and thus he would be called a Chaldean. When you live in a territory, when you live in a state, you know, if, if uh, you know, I lived in Florida, right? So they would call me a Floridian, right? Well, uh, it, that's, I mean, come on. How is it that we don't understand that, that if you lived in Ur of the Chaldees, which is the area, the state of sort, uh, the region, the province, whatever you call it, uh, then you were a Chaldean. There you go. At that point, Hebrews were called Chaldeans. But see, this changed. Why? Well, because Abraham left there. He left the area of the Chaldees. Thus, he's no longer a Chaldean. See? Now he'll be called a Hebrew. And that's why the Bible refers to him as Abraham the Hebrew. Why? Because Hebrew is a lineage that identifies the children of Eber. They don't have to be Israelites. Abraham had other sons, such as Ishmael. Ishmael was a Hebrew. Hello. Can we read? I mean, it's amazing that scholars can, and many can. Again, Josephus affirms that too. Abraham migrated, but the area remained the area of the Chaldees. This is restored later by a people carrying the title Chaldeans in the first century because they restore the name of the state or province or area of whatever sort uh, you want to call it uh, segment wise uh, because an area founded by the Hebrews before who were called Chaldeans because they lived in Chaldee, uh, Chaldees, the Chaldees. Uh, is this really that difficult? But those were no longer there. Abraham left. This should be no surprise in history. It's well documented. It's easy to find and follow. Now, we know they ignore Jubilees, which they've never tested, as we have proven as well. But how is it they don't even know Josephus or the book of Job? Uh, that's still in the Bible, isn't it? It's, is Job in your Bible? I'm pretty sure it is. And it's known to be the first book written in Torah, okay, or in, in the Bible. Even written before Moses, because Job is, is uh, supposedly, uh, he wrote before Moses. Now, whether that's true or not, that's the belief of most scholars. And I'm sure that Zondervan probably would agree with that. Doesn't matter if they don't. But the first use of the Chaldeans is in Job. And that precedes Moses. So this is just not rocket science. These guys are illiterate of Scripture. Even Josephus documents this, and he is getting this from Jubilees, really, uh, likely, uh, though he never credits Jubilees for anything. And uh, you can find several elements that he seems to quote from the book of Jubilees, because that's not in Genesis. It's not found in Torah anywhere else. Uh, and, you know, that would be, that would have to be his origin. Okay, so anyway, um, our Foxat, the son of Shem's, Okay, uh, and his descendants became known as the Chaldeans. There you go. They were Hebrews. They're from Shem. They're from Noah. But they're also from Eber because that's the line as it goes all the way down. And they're known as the Chaldeans. And again, with Jubilees, we, we firmly know this, uh, is so even to 2500 BC, in the days of our Foxat even, uh, at Noah's division of the earth, as there was an area called the Chaldees, period. Now that area changed because originally Chaldees was in Iran. It moved with the people, the Chaldeans, and then the Chaldees became a part of what we call modern I, 
Iraq, in southern Iraq, which later becomes a state of a later people, but it doesn't change all the history that occurred before and their actual origin of the name that Zondervan just simply doesn't know. This is where Abraham's ancestors from Peleg, we just showed Jeru, uh, Abraham's uh, grandfather, whatever, uh, settled there. Uh, Abraham migrated away from there. He left Ur, right? And he ended up, his end point was Canaan, the, the land of Israel. And Joktan, uh Eber's other son, brother of Peleg, he migrated to the far east, to Safar, uh, which is a reference to the Tree of Life, which is where? In the Garden of Eden to the Mount of the East. That's what Genesis 10.20 uh, tw or 10.30 10, says. But if you read 26 through 30, is that whole account there. We cover that in Solomon's Gold series very well, and no one will ever debate that. This is no mystery, yet Zondervan's scholars simply just don't know it. And they don't know what they're talking about, and they're not scholars, not of this topic. Uh, this is not an example of post-Moses at all. Neither is the first. They're 0 4 2 pretty bad. Let's go to the third. And here's Job, the book of Job 1, 17, who mentions the Chaldeans as a people, as a group, Chaldeans, before Moses, because these same scholars place Job as written before Moses, which is likely. How can Zondervans and other scholars not know the Bible at all, it seems? How can they know Job wrote of Chaldeans before Moses. I mean, that is not just a miss. That is gross negligence. So two out of three of the examples prove illiterate to Scripture. There you go. But let's go to the third. Do they finally redeem themselves on the third and final reference that supposedly proves that Moses did not write Genesis? Hmm. In Genesis 14:14, 14, 14, the narrator reports that Abraham chased the four ancient Near Eastern kings, the title kings, uh, who kidnapped Lot as far as Dan, the territory. Okay, this reference to the city of Dan is a post mosaica, uh, so after Moses, because the city earlier called Laish was not named Dan until the time of Judges. See Judges 18. This, as well, is a lie. And, of course, the name derived from the tribe of Dan. False. Named after Jacob's son, Dan. Other way around. They have it backwards. Abraham's great-grandson. Now, so is this true? No. Once again, this is completely false. They're 0 for 3, really. We'll show you. They simply are not very well-versed just not very well read in scripture and they don't know history selective history of course perhaps but especially they don't know ancient texts i mean anybody who's trying to cover that time period it doesn't bother to go to jubilees is and enoch for that matter uh it's just playing along in an illiterate paradigm uh they're not interested in actually restoring ancient geography and they're not going to more than likely here we go again we'll show you do you think they have ever considered, perhaps, some patriarchs uh, were named after previous persons that lived prior and even territories that existed prior? Oh, wow. What a, I, I mean, an enigma. <laughs> hmm. Of course, they haven't. That would require thinking, and they don't do that. Uh, that's clear. Uh, that would prove their positions wrong. That's the real problem. Someone else has to do that for them because, well, they're just too lazy to research it, it appears. Uh, we will. Additionally, the Hebrew word Dan is just D-N in Hebrew. I mean, can you get more generic than that? Uh, and that could actually even be a reference to Padan Aram, for that matter. Uh, duh. Uh, it doesn't have to be, but it could be. Just, just saying. Now, Here's what we know. This is, again, a far more ancient and reference, uh, name and reference, uh, regardless of the tribe of Dan, which is impertinent to this name. It does not necessarily refer to his territory. Uh, as, again, there's Padan Aram, uh, existed prior. Uh, but we don't need that, because here we go. In the days of Abraham and the title kings, was there a territory named Dan? Oh, no, long before that. First of all, 
it doesn't matter really, but the reference is repeated and affirmed in Jubilees 13.23. wanted to show you that quick. Uh, in the same story known as an area called Dan. Now that's simply fact. There you are, two witnesses. Uh, Genesis is affirmed by Jubilees. There you go. So how could you question it? Well, that's okay because we'll still obliterate this nonsense. It's simply fact. The tribe of Dan is later, yes, proving it is not the origin of the name. The name is generic. It's D-N. Duh. Uh, but perhaps it's the other way around. Maybe Dan is actually named for that territory. Oh, how about that? So the point is, there's no point here from these uneducated scholars. However, the Book of Enoch speaks of an area southwest of Mount Hermon in what we'd call Israel in those days and today, though it's you know changed in between, uh, where the watcher fallen angels occupied called the waters of Dan. So even the river there was called Dan, and or at least they were the waters of the territory called Dan, and Dan as a territory or city, either one doesn't matter. In fact, when Rachel named Dan, the tribe of Israel Dan, uh, in Genesis 30, verse 6, it's very interesting. She said, it means Elohim has vindicated me. And what was Dan before the flood? Well, it was a defiled land needing to be vindicated. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a watcher, fallen angel, Nephilim breeding ground, uh, uh, where Enoch met the watchers. Hello. I mean, this stuff is not that difficult and not that hard to find. It was a defiled land needing to be vindicated. No, Dan, the tribe of Israel, is not the origin of this name, which is ridiculous, and likely he was named after the territory. But again, that does not have to be the case either. We don't need to prove that, as no association is necessary for such a generic name, D-N. Dan as a territory existed before the flood, long before Israel. So what is Zondervan talking about? They have a very limited thinking. And they are obviously, uh, regarding ancient geography, illiterate of it, uh, which we have found of the scholarship arena as a whole in ancient geography. And we bump into them constantly, which is why we have to rebuke them all the time. They simply don't know. They don't really study it. And it just, it's not in their paradigm nor interest, it seems, but they sure do like to come up with these kinds of illiterate theories in which they are now 0 for 3. Uh, 3 out of 3, they are wrong. Now that is embarrassing. We've been seeing this one in comments every now and then as well. It is about as antiquated as can be in being disproved, really. Uh, this is an old, in terms of modern times, uh, hypothesis or theory, or actually it's just a guess. It's a dumb guess. Uh, called JEDP, the Documentary Hypothesis. Sounds so good, uh, you know, but we'll show you what they stand for. Hang on. Basically, these illiterates calling themselves scholars who came up with this uh, for centuries now, by the way, uh, this isn't new. Claim Genesis can be broken down in authorship and Torah, really, into four classifications of writers, other authors, not Moses. It is the brain trust of rabbis and Christian scholars, or in other words, it's brainless. Yeah, it would be better termed the how to screw up the Bible theory for idiots. And that will prove, just hang on. The J, completely illiterate, by the way, watch the Name of God series where we prove there is no J in ancient Hebrew, Aramaic, Latin, <laughs> Greek, Old French, Old German, Old English. None of the languages in which the Bible's been translated through, uh, as far as the main ones, even have a J. Not a J sound, not a J letter, period. Yes, Yiddish has a J sound, and Yiddish is not Hebrew, let's be clear. They take the verses that use the name Yahuwah, which is most certainly not Yahweh, stupid, or Jehovah, which are both nonsense, and cannot even be rendered in ancient Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, Latin, Old English, Old French, Old German, at all, 
because neither had a J or a V. They claim these were written by a different author from those that use the title Elohim, right? So, uh, you know, if one person uses, uh, you know, Yahuwah is actually the title, uh, the other one uses Elohim, and every time you see a different title in Scripture, it's a different author. How illiterate. Clearly, these were not scholars at all, nor could they you know, have the capacity to think even like a first grader. I mean, this is pathetic. It includes uh, at least the son, right? Elohim uh, is the father and the son. It's plural, and it's used because the father and the son created. Now, we're going to deal with that more, and we prove that out. If you haven't seen it, watch uh, 22 uh, works of creation where we do deal with that already some. Some say the Holy Spirit, which is not equated in such a sense in Scripture. But that's okay for this video until we, we get there, we, and we will get there. We're going to cover that. So they make up time frames as well to almost sound credible, except they are made up and meaningless, and they're not credible at all. Not on this topic. Uh, they've already proven themselves liars and fools. Moses wrote Genesis, and he wrote Elohim in the beginning, because the Elohim he refers to is two, the Father and the Son. Read John 1, which says, Yahusha created in the beginning, period. Uh, he specifies Yahuwah when he means only the Father, and Yahuwah Elohim, the same really, referring to only the Father, and that's the differentiation there, which is something that any author would do if, if they understood how the Bible worked and they understood the paradigm of the Father and the Son especially. They very stupidly claim Deuteronomy has a group of authors, again, requiring fraud, uh, and that's the D, and a cursed bunch according to Scripture, if so. I mean, understand that. You were not supposed to add to Torah. Hello. But Moses wrote Deuteronomy according to Deuteronomy, which we covered from the, uh, the outset of this video uh, from chapter 31. So these children calling themselves scholars need to learn how to read. They clearly can't. And then there's P for the priest, uh, where they forget that Moses was a prophet uh, who wrote, he was also a Levite, by the way, uh, who wrote Leviticus as well as all of Torah. Uh, I mean, not even just Moses said so, though. But so do many throughout Scripture, as Moses is directly attributed and credited even. How can they not know this? This is cataloged very well, and it's very easy to find, but we'll show you a couple of charts here. Here is a chart curated by Answers in Genesis. Of the many times, the Old Testament defines that Moses wrote, specifically wrote Torah. Not only Exodus and Numbers say they are written by Moses, but we already showed you Deuteronomy comes right out and credits Moses as well and says that's his words. And again, scholars, show us, show us the author who wrote down Moses' words. Show us. You won't, because it better be the guy that had the encounter at Mount Sinai. If it's not, it fails, and your whole theory fails. Joshua says Moses wrote Torah. Hello. So does Jeremiah, who wrote Kings and Chronicles. Ezra said so. Daniel, Malachi, and very directly in each case, pretty much. There is nothing to question and nothing to discuss here, especially not for the dumbest lie of this J-E-D-P nonsense. And another chart from Answers in Genesis regarding times in the New Testament that the Bible credits Moses is writing Torah, which most certainly includes Genesis, always has, which we will obliterate such position that says that it doesn't or says that Moses didn't write it next, uh, because we will go to the origin of Genesis, period. Messiah himself said so many times, why don't scholars know this? He didn't say someone pretending to be Moses wrote. He said Moses did, and that settles it, period. Luke and Paul document the same, as that is the paradigm of the entire Bible. It's never really legitimately been in question. There's no question where Bible is concerned that Moses wrote all of Torah. Never has been. There are stupid scholars who don't know how the Bible works, and see, that's the problem. They are. 
Already you can see there are really no points left, really absent a very direct reference uh, that says Moses wrote the creation account. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, we have that too. And we're going to cover that next. There is such a passage indeed in Torah. What? Yep, it's there. We will show you next. We'll continue this in the next video. Uh, the origin of Genesis, that is a whole video on its own, rightfully so, uh, with even more evidence that really brings us home, uh, with even very direct references written by Moses that he wrote the creation account uh, from the heavenly tablets, which is an eyewitness account from the angel of the presence, an archangel, who was with Moses on Mount Sinai. Duh. This is all very well credited and accurate. Oh, this is also confirmed... In the New Testament, at least twice, you'll see this is important. Let's firmly establish Torah according to the temple priest, which not only included Genesis, but its witness in Jubilees, we'll cover that next, where Moses tells us he wrote it and where he got this content before his era, in which he didn't live, where he got the content from. Coming next. Then our foundation will be set in order to begin this series with reliable accounts we can trust. The problem is many try to teach creation from rabbi doctrine. They call church doctrine, ignoring historical inspired scripture that they just don't understand is because they've never tested it. They prefer the occult, and that ain't the Bible. Many go to other occult books as well and treat them over scripture uh, because Genesis alone does not answer whatever question, but see, Genesis wasn't meant to. It has a second witness that's even more detailed than Genesis. And others, really, uh, the Job, Second Esdras, and others, uh, for portions as well that also give us a affirmation. Together, there's no mystery, and we will offer these in parallel in the coming videos as we teach the first two weeks of creation. Together, there's no mystery, and we will offer these uh, outright credible sources that we prove to be. Again, you'd have to actually read our testing of these uh, these books. First, before creation. That's where we'll start uh, after this next video. Then the first two weeks of creation, and this will be powerful. Because once you restore this and you understand, then you really start to get a foundation that you can understand Torah, you can understand prophecy. I mean, come on, this matters. It always has. Otherwise, we have a foundation built on sinking sand, which Messiah warned in, I, think, I guess, what, it's Matthew 7. Uh, he warned us about that. Then we'll chart creation and we'll deal with uh, strange doctrines. So we'll give you a timeline that you can use and you can teach from. Uh, but the strange doctrines that have arisen mostly from the censorship of Jubilees, which again will prove out. Uh, if you are not familiar with that book, we publish a copy of the R.H. Charles translation, the most credible, uh, with our research, including maps, charts, etc., and apply a comprehensive Torah test in the front in the introduction, including historicity. And that is hypercritical, and that's why we even published that book in the first place, was to get that Torah test down and get the research out there. That is super important. And that's why it's there in the front of the book. Direct quotes in Scripture, even. So it's really not that difficult. And we've done that research. Scholars haven't. Go to books of Jubilees, bookofjubilees.org and read the introduction. It'll blow your mind. Uh, we also have a 52-week series, Answers in Jubilees, if you have not reviewed it. Uh, we're off to a great start here for this series. Uh, and foundation is being laid. Understand that. Uh, you know, the true Bible account of creation needs to be restored, and it will be in this series. We hope everyone has learned at least a little something from this and much more to come. God bless. We have over 470 videos on this channel, one for every day of the year plus now. Uh, many just as profound with some 50 or so in Tagalog for Filipinos and now six in Spanish to start. We also have been setting up subtitles for 20 plus languages for most of our videos. Don't forget to like and subscribe and click the bell for notifications of new uploads. Join our email list as YouTube fails to notify often. And we will notify you ourselves at thegodculture.com. Just fill in the pop-up there. 
We now have alternative platforms for videos on Rumble, Odyssey, and Utreon. And our new podcast is available for all of our videos pretty much as well. All links in the description box and friend us on Facebook at The God Culture Space hyphen Space Original. That is our only Facebook page, only one that we're checking and using. Uh, if you prefer an alternative, we now have Parlor and Gab links below. We have six books published internationally being read in over 100 countries. Uh, and actually, I correct that. It's now seven. How about that? Uh, with our new release, the first book of Bible History Illustrated, Enoch's Animal Dream Visions. We also have now launched Ophir Philippines Coffee Table Book in the U.S., Canada, U.K., and many overseas markets on Amazon, and it's available in hardcover or softcover there. Also, this uh, first book of Bible History Illustrated is available only in color. We're not even doing this in black and white. Only in color, and you can get it in color, uh, softcover, or hardcover on Amazon. Uh, coming to the Philippines soon. Not yet. We're not there yet, but we will get there. Additionally, we launched the Book of Jubilees, the Torah calendar, with color maps and interiors, as so many had requested that overseas. Uh, rightfully so. Uh, we already have that in the Philippines. Uh, the Philippine copies have color maps inside already. Uh, that, too, is available on Amazon in hardcover, softcover, both in color or in black and white soft cover, if you wish. Uh, all books, including Solomon's Treasurer, are now free in ebook. Uh, we're not going to do an ebook for this one because we have this video series animated, and we're going to release one with all five uh, as one video as well. So, no need to do an ebook when we'll have the video animation. Uh, more coming soon. Thank you for watching. Now always remember, prove all things for yourself. Yah bless to everyone.